So I'm Nicola, a PhD student at the University of Amsterdam, and I'm also affiliated with the uh, University of Edinburgh. And today I'm going to talk about uh, generative models for uh, molecular graphs, uh, a work that I've done uh, last year as, as part of my master thesis. Uh, as a disclaimer, um, I'm a computer scientist, so I don't know much about chemistry. So uh, it, it was uh, quite hard, and probably you're going to see plots of, of molecules, and not 100% sure that they are uh, good enough. So if you, <laughs> if you can comment on that, I, I would appreciate. Um, so um, why we do... Uh, why we do molecular generation? Well, uh, as, you have, as you have heard in the previous talk, um, drug design uh, and drug discovery is a very uh, it's it's a very hard problem. It's co it's time consuming. It's very costly. It requires a, a lot of years of of, of research and uh, and clinical trials. And uh, one of the early stage of of this long process is to. Um, is to start with uh, with, uh, with with some uh, candidates, let's say uh, ten thousand uh, candidates, uh, and then go on uh, with uh, with with um, with tests, uh, not only in the lab but also on uh, on simulations. And uh, and we are going to deal with uh, the, the early stage, so trying to to discover molecules and. Um, uh, using machine learning and generative models. So uh, indeed one of the two, uh, there, there are two ways of, uh, of, of doing drug discovery. One is screening large um, libraries of, of molecules and another is uh, generating and discovering new one. And we are gonna do, we're going to do the second one. Um, uh, how do we study the problem? Uh, so there are different approaches on, on generat uh, generating molecules. Uh, one is uh, generating uh, SMILES representations. Um, SMILES representation is a string-based uh, representation of, of molecules. And what people have been doing in the past few years is to try to, to generate this representation because it's, it's uh, it's it's quite easy problem. It's just a generation of, of um, a set of characters, um, and uh, and but the, the problem with uh, the Smyre representation is that uh, you have syntax and and semantics in uh, in this representation, and uh, it, it seems that uh, neural networks uh, they can learn to some extent uh, syntax, but it's quite hard to capture the semantic because you can generate. Um, can generate uh, syntactically correct uh, 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 correct strings, smile strings, but uh, sometimes they are not uh, possible. There are not molecules that can exist in the real world uh, because of the semantic. Um, so we we follow um, what people have been doing uh, recently. So we generate uh, graphs instead of of, of strings. Um, and uh, in particularly labeled graphs, because uh, nodes and, and nodes that are atoms uh, have labels and also edges have, have, have labels. And uh, what, what I've been doing is to uh, try to answer a question, a couple of questions. Uh, first, um, is it better to use like, likelihood-based uh, methods, uh, like uh, rational autoencoders, or like to free methods as uh, generati generative adversarial networks? And uh, another question that uh, I, I wanted to answer is uh, how, effective, uh, how effective is to use um, reinforcement learning to bias the process and generate molecules that have some properties. And, and I, I have combined reinforcement learning with both uh, rational encoders and GANs, and I try to, to answer, answer these questions. So, uh, before I dive into uh, the models, I want to give you um, a bit of background on, on variational encoders, GANs, and, and enforcement learning. So we have heard about uh, variational autoencoders a lot uh, yesterday. Um, a brief recap, um, we, have, um, we, we have two components uh, in, in variational autoencoders. We have an, an encoder, um, this green thing, the, uh, that has to t has to take uh, any any data point. Uh, so in this case, images. In our case, would be molecules, but it's it's, it's more generally can be any any kind of data. 
and it has to uh, it has to compress uh, this data uh, in a vector, and and then uh, the, um, the the decoder here has to uh, has to take this vector and generate the same data point data point again. And when we, uh, since we want to use the model as a, as a generative model, we need to make sure that in, in this space, in the, in the Z space, uh, the distribution of, of these vectors follows a distribution for which we can sample from. And uh, what, people, what people used uh, was to uh, have a prior over the distribution of Z, usually uh, a fully factorized Gaussian, but it's not limited to that. You can have uh, other kind of of distributions in in the, in the Latin space, but uh, Gaussians are uh, fine for most most of the applications. So when you when you train these models, uh, you uh, you want to uh, minimize the extraction error. So you want to generate the data points as close as possible to the original one, and you want to minimize. Um, we want to minimize uh, the uh, any uh, divergence from uh, the the distribution that you are generating and the and your prior set. So um, this is what uh, the generative model uh, of a variational autoencoder looks like. Um, well, a simple variational autoencoder because uh, usually people think a variational autoencoder is just a model with two variables. Uh, this is the most simple variation of the colors you can have. You can have also multiple variables, but um, for the sake of simplicity, we only use two. Um, you have sum of observation x, which are uh, the data points, and you assume um, that these points are generating for a, a lower, um, uh, a lower dimensional manifold uh, and, uh, z, and you want to learn. Uh, you want to infer Z from your data points, so you don't know, you don't observe Z. And uh, how how you do that? Uh, you want to maximize the log evidence of your model, so the probability of of um, observing the data of, of your data set. And uh, you can rewrite the log probability of observing the data, marginalizing over uh, your latent variable because you. Because you don't know, you, you don't observe the variables, so you, you cannot make any any assumption on uh, on Z. Uh, the problem here is that, um, it, it, like for very simple models, like linear models, uh, you can do you can solve the integral exactly, but uh, linear models are um, boring. Uh, they, they they cannot model like a highly nonlinear. Uh, Dependencies from from Z to X, and if you think about like in the space of images, it's a too uh, it's a too simplifying assumption, uh, saying that there is just a linear dependence between uh, a vector and, and images is uh, is not enough. So we want we want to use um, nonlinear functions like. Uh, and possibly we want to learn these nonlinear functions um, with neural networks. Uh, and the problem is that as soon as you plug neural networks, you cannot solve the integral exactly. And even with uh, like Monte Carlo approximations, uh, is still is still not enough. So, so what you can do is to do um, a variational approximation of um, and instead of um, instead of optimizing the uh, log evidence you optimize uh, a lower bound of, of the evidence. So what it means is that it, since this is a lower bound of, of, of your objective, you're still going towards optimizing the true objective. Uh, but people in like, the past two years, they also pointed that uh, optimizing the lower bound is not exactly optimizing the, the, log, uh, the log evidence. So let's say this is good because it, it can make the problem tractable, but there are a few people that argue that it's not uh, the right direction to explore in the future, but I'm not going to dive into that. Um, so this, uh, so as I, as I said before, what you, what you do here is to optimize, um, is to maximize uh, the probability of generating, uh, of reconstructing your data. So it's, it's, this, uh, it's this part. So this is an, an expectation of, a, of your samples to generate again the, the data. 
while you also minimize the divergence of, your, um, of the vectors that you are generating and your prior. And, uh, and the, the prior uh, depends on the parameters, so you can also uh, learn the prior. Uh, and there have been work that do, that do that, but for the sake of simplicity, we, we, we define prior as a Gaussian and we don't, we don't learn that. Uh, we are optimizing the uh, this part, this loss. So not not this. So this you you would like to to optimize this, but it's intractable. So you optimize uh, a lower bound of that. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and as as I said, you like it has been proven that you sometimes you have a weird behavior. So even if you are optimizing uh, a lower bound and the model seems to have very very low loss uh, then your samples maybe are not good and uh, uh, because the like the uh, global minimum of one it doesn't mean that is the global minimum of the other it's just just it's just a, a bound you know okay um, Can I sure or maybe a comment slash question so um, I mean variation audio equals always motivated by this approximation, but I think there's another important approximation that is the fact that P of X, Z cannot really be computed, right? P of F X given a... Uh, first term, I mean, in practice, what people use here are things like cross entropy, pixel wise... Oh, oh yeah, you only do one sample, uh, usually, well, during training. One sample, but you also replace this, I mean, this is a general multi-dimensional probability density. Yes. You yeah. cannot compute if you use a feed forward, an arbitrary feed forward. True. Right? True. So you replace it by another function which has the same arc mean, like uh, mean square error or something like this, or arc max. Uh, but you can use uh, like uh, cross entropy if you want. But yep. that is not the right probability. Is a is a pixel wise? Um, oh, but for images. But what if what, what if you have data that are. Um, like uh, not images, and then you, you can have cross entropy because maybe your data is uh, categorical, and then the true log likelihood is categorical. Like for pixels, I agree, but but what if you have uh, like black and white images for which pixels are can be only only black or only white? It comes from Bernoulli, then you have Bernoulli likelihood. But this this assumes that the pixels are uh, IID. I mean, it is a it is a simplification of sure, 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 sure. It ignores any correlations between pixels. Sure. So what I'm saying is, you replace this p of x given z, which could be like this super complicated object that maybe you could compute if you had a flow or something, some exact like you, uh, a model there. You just replace this by another function which has the same argument or at max. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this argument only works if if you're kind of optimal in both terms and you're not because they play against each other. So it's I think it's an additional approximation that is can be very severe. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. But it's uh, what what people have been doing because uh, I mean uh, as like 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 the no 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 uh, sure 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 like it's it's kind of. Not mentioned in the, in the approximation, and I, I think this is one of the things that makes images fuzzy. Yes, exactly. Because when you use like a deconvolution, like you, you are not uh, like it's, it's like you, you also start from low, low dimensional uh, vector space. You do some deconvolution steps, and the, the image is very blurry because it's it's not uh, it cannot be sharp because. Just for this reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. Correct, so correct. This does reflect the way the model actually works typically, which is you predict a probability, you know, probability distribution for every um, uh, dimension of the output, right? So every pixel you predict a probability distribution. And then when you say I'm generating an image, you just it, sample yeah. it, right? Independently from each of those. That's yeah, the tip that, and so that is actually, you are actually computing what the model actually does in some sense. Right, because that's the way the generation process actually works. You produce independent probability distribution, you sample from it. 
if you had a more complicated generation process like the beam search that we saw yesterday, then this would be wrong. I mean, your Z variables are uncoupled, right? If you send them from a ghost, the individual oh, yeah, dimensions of Z are independent of each other. But the individual dimensions of X, uh, when you pass this to an arbitrary key forward network, are not independent anymore. So P of X given Z is not just a product of the pixel-wise generation process. It's just not the right probability. I think it is at the end of the point, because at the end of the day, the, the model produces probabilities of black white for every pixel. Yeah, right, and then how do you get that's, that's not that's that's independent. independent. There are multiple. But that's how you generate it, right? You generate it independently. I agree that they're not independent. Because you're not generating the pixels correctly, you're generating the Z. That's the way you are, I think. That's, that's yeah, yeah, that's a good discussion. <laughs> hey, by the way, the um, fully factorized Gaussian is not the only prior you can have. Like you, you say that Z, uh, it's like all the coordinates of Z are independent, and if, if you use a fully factorized Gaussian, but if you're if you're not, then they are not. But I, th I think it doesn't matter which prior you use. The point is just you can only compute uh, p of x given z given P of C if you have an exact likelihood model for this step for the decoder. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, you you don't know what P of X given Z is. You have to replace it by a zero and that is what's happening. In yeah. The yeah. But okay. Maybe, maybe we can maybe we can discuss later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's uh, let's move on. Um, so I'm going to talk about likely to free generative process. So the generation algorithm coders are likely to base models because you use the likelihood to to optimize um, to, to optimize the models. Uh, and in a generative adversarial networks, you don't. So how 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 they work is is the following. So like how. How do we assess, uh, like a human can assess if, if data points, let's say humans can distinguish whether uh, images are fake or real. Like you model generate an image and you as a human can assess whether um, an image is, is true or is fake. Uh, and you can tell the model that. And let's assume that the model can learn from that and generate um, images that are more realistic because you, you, you could provide feedback. Um, and this is basically uh, the idea behind uh, generative adversarial networks. So you have two, two uh, main components. Uh, one is uh, your generator. It basically takes samples from, um, from a, a distribution that you know and, and generate data points. Which are, which are which are let's say fake that fake data points because are not data that you observe are data that are generated and then you have a second component called a discriminator which is gonna mimic what what a human would do in, in this in the case of images so it w the discriminator is gonna is gonna ask, is gonna predict whether uh, data points come from a uh, from G, so whether if they are generated or they come from the data distribution, and and if you make if you make these two components, uh, if 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 you if you um, if you make these two components uh, with neural networks, and you and you train that with uh, stochastic gradient descent, uh, you can learn a good generator because the gradient is gonna is gonna flow from D to G. So how, how, how do you train this model is, is the following. You have the discriminator D that acts li like a classifier. He has to classify, uh, it, it, it's, it's just a binary classi classification problem. It just takes, takes inputs and, and predicts the binary labels 0, 1. And, and, and if this is a neural network, and uh, for instance, this generates images, you can just plug that in and optimize optimize this back and you have and you, and you can train G to generate realistic realistic samples from from your data points and like more, more precisely you are you are optimizing you're optimizing this objective so you have um, so you have uh, the theta parameters for G and and the phi parameters for D and it's a min min max gain because um, because the discriminator is gonna is, is gonna 
it wants to minimize the, uh, the classification error where the generator is actually trying to fool the discriminator. So, so that's why, what, that's why you, you want to, um, you want to uh, maximize, uh, maximize the, uh, the, the, the evidence uh, for phi, but uh, the, the parameters of your generator has to minimize to minimize the classification error. And uh, this, this doesn't require evaluation of a likelihood, uh, which for some, some problems is good. Like for images, you generate much more sharper images because you're not, you're not working uh, in, a, in a distribution space, but you're actually working in image space. So an image that is blurry, it's gonna be classified by the discriminator as non-real. So the generator is never gonna generate blurry images because if it does, then it's gonna, it's gonna have a very high loss. And with this objective, this objective comes with uh, problems, uh, sadly, uh, because since it's a, it's a min-max uh, objective, uh, it's hard to find, to find a, a, good, um, a good minima. Or, or uh, to, to this objective, because th you see the two two components of, 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 of the model uh, are are competing uh, against each other, and you can have subtle points in uh, in, in parameter space. Uh, so what um, what people have, have been doing in the past few years is to propose uh, alternative objectives, uh, and I'm not gonna I'm gonna talk about about them because they are like let's say slightly variation of, 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 of this guy here. Um, but uh, I'm gonna leave references is if, you, if you want to look at them. Um, in this work, uh, in particular, we play with uh, uh, Wasserstein guns uh, with a gradient penalty uh, because um, at, at the time of, 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 what I, of when I uh, work, was working on that, it was uh, the state of the art on, uh, on guns. Um, then uh, a question: Can we? So we can get rid of uh, likelihood-based models uh, with GANs, but can we also optimize generative process uh, towards non-differentiable objective? Because, uh, as I said here, this is this is differentiable because uh, if, if you have two neural networks, you can always. Uh, backpropagate to G and optimize a differential objective. But what if, uh, what if you want to optimize solubility on for molecules? Uh, you you cannot. You cannot have a neural network that just tells you how soluble is is a molecule. I mean, you can learn. You can learn a network that does that, but. It's uh, you, you, you want maybe you have a system that is not differentiable, like a set of rules that takes some molecules and tells you how how soluble is that based on rules, and this is not differentiable. So one um, one nice framework uh, to do that uh, is reinforcement learning, and uh, as you as you may know from from the previous talk, basically uh, it works like that. You have uh, an agent. Uh, that uh, that has to play in an in an environment in order to maximize uh, the reward that is getting from the environment. Uh, so in case uh, in case of games, your your agent is a player and the environment is is, is a game. And at every time step, the, the the agent has to play to do an action, and is gonna get a, a new state from the environment and possibly a reward. Uh, in our case. Uh, instead, since we want to generate molecules, an agent would be uh, our generative model. It would be our uh, any 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 system that can generate a molecules, and the environment is gonna be uh, any system that can ac assess a reward of of the molecules. For instance, if you want to maximize uh, solubility, an agent agent would be an, any 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 system that generate molecules. And the environment would be a system that takes some molecules and it can access uh, how soluble is that. And it's gonna give uh, to the agent a reward based on how soluble is, is the molecule. Um, and and uh, uh, of course, our, our agent would be, uh, it would be implemented with um, um, machine learning techniques. So we want to learn 
to, to learn uh, to have a good agent towards these, these rewards. Um, so there are very different ways to learn um, reinforcement learning agents. And, and the, because it depends if the action space is continuous or, or discrete, or if the state space is discrete or, or continuous. And what we did was to, um, to, to do um, uh, an approximation of, uh, of, of the actions as uh, continuous actions. Because um, you see, the, the, the pro like one of the problems of reinforcement learning is differentiability. You cannot uh, have the gradient of a discrete sample. Uh, you can estimate the gradient uh, with an expectation, but you, you cannot. And when you generate a molecule, you either have an atom or a bond, or you don't. You don't have, like, uh, of course you have a probability distribution of an atom to be present when, when your model predicts a probability, but when you actually generate something, it's, 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 it's either an atom or not. So what we did was to approximate uh, these uh, discrete uh, actions, these discrete choices of, of producing molecules with a continuous, uh, continuous relaxation. Uh, and then we can uh, optimize with um, stochastic gradient descent. And, and uh, deep deterministic policy gradients is a way to do so. And it consists of having, uh, again, two, two components, two networks. Um, one is the network um, MU. Uh, that generate uh, an action. In our case, uh, from the state, from the, the environment state, is going to generate an action. And this is pretty general. And in our case, the state here would be a sample from, from a Gaussian, because you want to, to sample. And an action would be generation of a molecule. So an action would be, would be the model gives the, the action, this, it gives this molecule as an, as an action. So you're going to produce a molecule. And and then we have a second component called the Q network. Q stands for quality uh, network that is going to take uh, the state. In the general case, it's going to take the state from the environment and an action, and it's going to predict uh, how you how um, it's going to predict the expected return of this action given the state of the environment. So in, in, in case when you, when you, when you, when you play, in a, when the agent plays in an environment, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a function of the state of the environment and the action. In our case, it's going to be only uh, a function of the, uh, of, the, of the molecule. But still, how, how, can you, how can you learn Q? You don't have Q. Q has to learn to assess the expected return. So, how you do that is to is, is using uh, off policy deterministic policy gradient uh, by by silver. Um, so what you want what you want as as a loss is, is you want to to maximize the expectation when you when you sample uh, actions of the of, of of the expected return. The the return is the reward that you are giving to the systems. So in this case, in case of molecules like solubility, and since you're doing this, uh, since you're, you're, you're implementing these two guys with neural networks and your action space is continuous, because in our case, it's a continuous relaxation, you do have a gradient for, for your policy. Because you can just apply the chain rule, and you, you can optimize the parameters of, of, your, of your generative models, uh, because Q, Q is going to give a gradient for the action. But then, how do you learn Q? Well, you can learn Q uh, minimizing the, uh, the square error um, between the actual output of Q and your reward uh, of your uh, non-differentiable system. So in, in, the, in the case of molecules, you, you generate a molecule. You give the molecule uh, to Q. And Q is going gonna, is gonna to predict uh, how soluble is that. But then you also give the molecule to a rule-based system is going to assess how actual soluble this molecule is. And you are minimizing the, uh, the distance between the, 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 the output of Q and the reward. So at the beginning of the training, of course, this prediction is going to be random. But then if you train and you train and you train, if Q is close enough to approximate the a true reward, Q is learning to say how much soluble the molecule is, and then the, the policy is going to actually optimizing the solubility. 
of course, it's, a, it's an approximation, but it's, it, it's something. Um, OK, so this, this is pretty general. Uh, like th this, this, this kind of stuff, like action and, and states are pretty general. So I'm going to talk about how we instantiate that in with, the, with molecules. Sure. And it's, it's not a lookup table. Uh, so, so, so in in practice, what we did was to use uh, RD kit uh, to predict uh, properties. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it, because because if you have a lookup table, it means that you already have all the actions. Uh, like it's a, you know, it's, you you have a fixed number of actions, and for every action, you you have a reward. Uh, but in the space of molecules, uh, no, you cannot enumerate all the molecules. So, we used RD kit to assess uh, properties. Uh, and, and then uh, at every time, is, uh, RD kit is just going to give you a scalar for every molecule. And uh, that's. Question, question about this formulation here. Uh, yes. Uh, you don't have any future actions here? Which no. Is normal. So I mean, this to me sounds like you're just building an approximator for a, a differential approximator to what RD kit will say about a single molecule. Yes. Right, you phrased it in a reinforcement learning. Well, you have terms here, but there's no, there's not a set of actions. I mean, there's, it's one step. Yeah, you, you I mean, you have a, a reinforcement, uh, you have a reinforcement learning algorithm, which only in, in any episode is one step. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> yes. It's a, it's a weird formulation to say it's a. It's an NDP where, where there's there, there's every, only one. Everything is one step long. Yes. Right? Yes. I can use that language, but it's a really weird language to use, right? Because you're just building an approximator to R. That's all you want. Right? Yes. Yes. Your, yes. Yes. That's true. But in it, yeah, but uh, it depends. If you use a recurrent generator uh, for the molecules, uh, it's not. Yes, then it would be different. Then so that would be that's different. No, that's not what I, I've been doing. Uh, I I played with also recurrent models, uh, but they didn't work that well. Uh, we can talk about it later if you, if you want. Um, so, so models. So, how we do this with uh, molecules? So, uh, as I said, uh, we use a graph representation um, instead of, of a string-based representation. Uh, so, this molecule would be encoded as, as this graph, and in particular, uh, this graph can also be encoded in two two objects. Uh, one is uh, an annotation metric X, which is going to encode uh, for every row um, a, um, an atom type, and an adi adjacency tensor, which is going to uh, which is basically an extension of an adjacency matrix for graph. But then you also have a depth which is going to tell you also um, which kind of edge. So you don't have like 0 and 1, and when, when there is a 1, there is an edge. You also have the depth uh, that's going to tell you uh, which kind of edge. Um, and, and what we do when we generate, uh, of course, we, don't, we, don't, we cannot generate discrete uh, atom types, but we generate a distribution of uh, a, disti uh, a distribution over types. So for every uh, atom in, in a molecule, we generate distribution, and then we, we, we can sample and have actually a, a um, an hard sample. Uh, and the same, the same thing with the, this adhesive tensor. So you, it's going to be uh, n by n, where n is number of, 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 moly of uh, atoms you are generating. And, and then in the depth, you're going to have a distribution, that, uh, a distribution that sums to 1, and then you are, you are going to uh, sample uh, 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 which kind of uh, bond you have in, uh, in the molecule. Um, uh, as, as I said, uh, as I said uh, at, at the beginning, what we want um, what we want is to use neural network for uh, like everywhere for VAEs and um, and GANs and reinforcement learning, and uh, the, the problem is that we we need to find an, a good architecture to actually uh, process graphs, uh, because uh, because the, if we, if you deal with images then you do convolution if it is with the other kind of data you do whatever but for graphs uh, you you need to, to to do something specifically for graph. Oh. Why is there any given pair of tones? Only shares one type of edge? 
Yes, they do. Yes. So it's, it's, it's either a single bound or double or any, 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 anything. Yeah. Um, so what we used was uh, a graph convolution network. Uh, so you, you are probably very familiar with uh, the definition of, uh, of convolution and also the definition of discrete convolution. So I, I'm not going to go, go through that. Uh, since we also uh, heard about uh, Sovier talk yesterday, we know everything about convolutions. Uh, but just a few few words. So convolution usually is a, uh, it's an operator that takes, uh, for instance, for images, it takes this image and it's going to apply a filter uh, which is gonna is gonna be basically a multiplication as a sum, and the value of this pixel is is, is uh, it depends on the value of, of this pixel multiplied by by, by this filter. So the, the the value of this pixel is gonna depend uh, at the next at the next step is gonna depend on on its neighbors of, of a given window, and 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 the same thing is gonna happen with uh, with graphs. So if if uh, if this is an image. And you do a convolution. Uh, the value of, of the pixel at the next step of the convolution is gonna is gonna be a function of its neighbors of, of a given of a given windows. And you do apply the, the same thing uh, with arbitrary graph. So in uh, in this case, the, the, the topology is regular, and you're you're dealing with pixels. When you do we do things in graph, the topology can be arbitrary. Uh, can be can be whatever, but still the concept of, of having a convolution in a graph it, it means that at the next next step, the, <coughs> the value that, 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 that this node is going to have is going to be a function of itself and and the neighbors of a given windows as well. Um, and, but the problem. The problem with with the with, with that this is uh, with with graph with only one edge type. So when you have different edge types, you uh, you also want to deal with that. Um, so for instance, with molecules, if if um, edges are bounds, you want to have a function that also depends on the kind of bounds, uh, and that's why we used uh, things called a relational uh, graph convolution network. Relational is because um, in, a, in, in the graph, um, in the graph literature, uh, edges are also intended as relations between between nodes, and in in particular, uh, what we do is to use this uh, tensor, uh, the addition the tensor that we have, and basically the value of of a node at the at the next step is going to be a nonlinear function of itself and a pulling operator of the neighbors. But not only that, it's not going to be only a pulling operator of his neighbor. It's going to also be a pulling operator over edge types. So different edge types would have specialized functions. So if you have a single bound or a double bound, there are going to be different functions that act and, and propagate the information. Um, and, and also at the at the end, uh, if you think about um, in, in the genetic other side of the network, oh. it's just not entirely clear to me when you have the arbitrary topology. How do you define the convolution network? Like, what is the filter? How do you define the filter of a convolution? Uh, if you have a regular topology, it's much more intuitive. Whereas if you have this arbitrary topology, yeah, 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 I, I can comment on that. Uh, so the so the thing with images, you have um, we have two we have two axes and channels. But let's say we only have two 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 D coordinates, and you have an order like going like a top or down. They have a, a meaning because on on images, if you just rotate the images, it's, it's, it's not it's not a proper image anymore, right? And and, and this is going to give you a, a very highly structural space, right? So graphs are less structures. Uh, because if you just permute, if you just ro rotate this graph, or you just invert the order of, of, of the nodes, like it, it's, it's going to be the same. So it's less less structured. Uh, so um, so what people do is is in in in, in the case here uh, when you do a filter, it's going to be basically a sum of of, of multiplication of the neighbors pixels. In here, it's going to be a sum of nonlinear functions. Of, of the neighbors without uh, considering the order. So in the, because in this case, the function that is going to act 
uh, on this pixel or on this pixel is going to be different, but not in this case. Like the function is going to is going to uh, it's going to take this this, this node uh, or this node is going to be the same. Does it does it answer your your question? Okay. Um, and, and yeah, the problem is that it's not structured, like not as, as images. And another thing that we, we we also need is a pulling operator over the nodes, because at the at the end of the day, we want a model uh, that takes a graph and generate, for instance, a scalar uh, for the discriminator, for the discriminator, for instance. So we also need to uh, to have a nonlinear function that takes all the edges and produce a single vector. And we do this using an, an attention mechanism. So it's going to be a function of a nonlinear function of, of every node multiplied by a sigmoid function of um, of also a, a, a nonlinear function of, of every of every um, node. Uh, meaning that if there if the network if the since these are learned, the network can learn to give uh, more importance to some uh, atoms and less importance to to other atoms. Uh, and this is how, how then the variational autoencoders will look like. We have deficiency, tensor, and annotation matrix. We embed them in two vectors. We're going to sample noise, we're going to sum and multiply, we generate vector, and we do reconstruction. And, we, uh, and the reconstruction term is going to be a sum of two uh, categorical cross entropy. Uh, because the, um, these are uh, the, the, these objects contains uh, categorical variables, uh, because the atom is just uh, a category over over, over the, all the atoms and also for, for the bounds. Uh, same story for guns. Um, we, we sample noise. Uh, we generate these two tensor. Uh, we need here to to actually sample the tensors. Uh, to sample uh, uh, the tensor and the matrix, because uh, if you think about that, uh, the discriminator can easily spot fake molecules when these objects are uh, dense objects and not um, sparse objects. Because if you, if the network is going to generate a distribution over uh, the type of atoms, but uh, the, the discriminator, uh, it, it's an easy job for the discriminator to just say, whenever you see a dense vector, then of course it's going to be from the generator. And whenever you see a, a discrete uh, a tensor with the discrete uh, rows, then it's going to come from the data. And it's super easy. So that's why you need to, to sample. And you can use um, some tricks to make the uh, sample from uh, categorical variables uh, differentiable. It's not going to have an exact, uh, an exact gradient. It's an estimation of the gradient. It's, but, uh, it's biased, but still is, uh, is a good approximation for, 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 for the gradient. Um, when you plug uh, the reinforcement learning, uh, with in combination with GANs, for instance, the architecture will look like will look like this. So you still, you, you, as before, you have uh, you sample, you generate the molecules, and you have a discriminator. But you also have uh, this Q this Q function here that's going to take the molecules and it's going to predict how good is the molecule based on uh, some score we define. And how, how and as I said before, with with the, uh, with the reinforcement learning, we also we also learn this uh, from the data because the and uh, and because the data are going to tell us uh, like which kind of molecules have uh, which kind of reward and and all of these component plugged in are going to be used to have a good generator that both optimize uh, plausibility of molecules because the discriminator is going to give feedback about that and also is going to optimize some property that we want, like solubility or, or, or any, any other score. Um, so now we're going to answer the question we had at the beginning. So at the end of the day, is better likelihood-free or likelihood-based models? The reinforcement learning actually helps. And is it better than SMILES? Is each generating graph better than SMILES? Uh, we, and we run uh, these experiments on uh, QM9, which is a data set of uh, around 150,000 uh, uh, compounds, uh, up to nine uh, heavy atoms. 
Uh, so one of the advantages of variational encoders uh, is that we train an encoder. So we don't only have a generative model, but we also can assess where molecules are in a latent space because we also train an encoder. So it's going to be useful if we want to sample around molecules that we already know. We can encode and sample around uh, a sample around that point in the latent space and, and have molecules. And as you see, uh, the, the, the model we have, they kind of do a pretty good job on, on reconstruction. It's not perfect, uh, but consider that, uh, that we do sampling. So they, like it's unlucky that they generate a perfect a reconstruction because we sample the, the atoms and the bonds. Uh, but o o overall, they, they, they seem to, to do a good job. And, the, and, we, uh, and when we optimize, uh, when, when what we notice is that when we optimize also towards, um, towards uh, like a non-differentiable score like solubility, uh, we encounter problem because uh, as it was pointed out yesterday, when VAEs tends to match the, the statistics of the data. And the problem is when, when, as soon as you plug reinforcement learning and you bias, and you, you bias the, pro, the, the process towards generating different statistics because you want diff, different molecules that optimize different things, uh, you're not longer in the, in the in, you're not, not longer in the data in the dataset statistics, and and there is a mismatch between these two. You 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 cannot optimize these two at the same time. And this is one flow of using uh, likelihood-based models uh, in, in, in for, for this task. That it's you, you cannot optimize these two things at the same time because they, they have different uh, they, they convert to different they have different uh, local minima in, in the loss. You, you either optimize one, you either optimize the other. You cannot do both. And as a, as an example. Uh, we, th this is how the distribution of the uh, syn syn uh, synthetic accessibility score looks like when we run a WGAM model uh, 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 without reinforcement learning. And uh, the distribution is going to be almost the same for VAEs, but this is just to, 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 show you, uh, to, to show you the point. So if you just train on data, uh, the gun is gonna is gonna have this uh, the, 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 when you gener when you sample from the from the gun uh, and you measure this statistic the distribution is gonna look the same because you train on the data so what the model sees and what the model is optimizing is to generate from the same distribution but as soon as you plug reinforcement learning and you want to minimize uh, to minimize this score then then the distribution shifts because you're not in, you're not longer optimizing. Uh, to mimic the statistics of the data, but you're also optimizing another another score. And uh, suddenly, when we tried this on with variational autoencoders and reinforcement learning, this was not the case. Like you, you couldn't you couldn't have different distributions because you either have the same statistics or the other. But if you have a different statistics, you are you 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 don't have a good a good reconstruction. So the likelihood of observing the data uh, it's it's very low. So if you if I take one of the systems from your brown distribution all the way to the left, mm -hmm. uh, I predict the score. Is this prediction error now worse than for a molecule coming from the blue distribution? Uh, uh, what do you mean wrong? You mean the, the, the Q, Q is going to predict a, a bad uh, value for that? The, the prediction error of your score uh, so, so, okay, maybe it's not clear. This is not this is not a prediction. This is actually using um, like RD kit to actually assess the score. Like the the blue distribution is uh, when when you when you take the data and you compute the uh, SAS score. This is the distribution of, of of the molecules in the data set. When you sample from the model, uh, this is the distribution that you obtain. So there, there is no like, error in the, like this is just the the score that uh, that RDKit is giving basically uh, for for the SAS score. Uh, 
And then another question, is uh, reinforcement learning actually useful? Like, like, is it, like apart from this picture, can, can, we, can, we do, uh, can we assess other things? So what we did was to take, uh, to, to, to basically uh, uh, run multiple experiments with different trade-offs between uh, the two objectives. So uh, when you optimize, uh, when you optimize like, the construction or the gun loss, uh, and reinforcement learning, of course, it's a multi multi objective loss. So you can you can also uh, uh, regularize that to to a parameter. So here we have uh, different models from on, uh, using only reinforcement learning and to using uh, no no reinforcement learning, and uh, and to optimize the uh, uh, quid score, which is a quantitative est estimate of drug likeliness drug drug likeliness. Um, one thing I have to say is that when we say uh, full, full reinforcement learning, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not quite correct. We do pre-training first, and then we, and then we only optimize uh, the reinforcement learning objective. And what the, the reason why we do that is because when you only use reinforcement learning, um, at the beginning of the training, the samples are so far from the data distribution that the model is not able to learn anything. So that's why we need to pre-train. Um, and one thing that we notice is that as as much reinforcement learning we uh, as, as much reinforcement learning we use, as much the validity of the molecules increase, and but and also the score increase because we are optimizing the score the score more. So this is this is good. And also this is good. One thing that is not good, is not satisfying, is that um, when we use reinforcement learning more. Uh, when we sample, we have less unique molecules, meaning that when the model generates, uh, when we say when we sample, I don't know, like 5,000 molecules, then only like in this case, only 10% of them are actually unique, meaning that when we sample 5,000 molecules, there are only 500 molecules out of the sample, meaning that some of them are duplicates, and this is and this is happening. Uh, and this behavior is called um, mode collapse uh, in, in machine learning, and uh, meaning that the model at this stage is generating very few modes. So it's not gonna it's not gonna generate a very diverse uh, set of, of molecules, but it's gonna generate only only few of them, only the the few that actually have a high uh, quad sc uh, QED score. Um, and this is something that it's uh, it, we don't we don't like that because uh, as I said before, when we generate molecules, we want to to diversify like as much as possible. Um, so there is also something like a curiosity driven reward. So after a certain yeah, uh, we we, di we didn't play with that, but um, <coughs> but the one thing that you can do is to 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 also optimize that. Like you you take a set. And you, and you say, oh, among the, re the like one part of the reward is also uh, competing something that is not is more unique. Yeah, you can do that, but we didn't. Quick question on that. Do you think? Do you ascribe that to the reinforcement learning process, or do you, or maybe is it perhaps the loss that you use? Are you using this rule-based system? Do you think? It's um, so I think it's um, so I think it's, do you, uh, so when you when you not you, when you don't use uh, reinforcement learning, you are matching the data distribution. Well, as as much RL you plug in, the model is gonna is gonna f n forget the data distribution because it's gonna it, it, the model you are optimizing the model not to follow the data distribution, but to generate m to generate uh, molecules that maximize the reward. So the thing is, uh, if you don't want only to maximize the reward, there is nothing, nothing that nothing stops the model to generate only one molecule all the time, which maximizes the score. And uh, because when you only use reinforcement learning, the model doesn't have to follow the data distribution. The model can generate one molecule. There is no laws that that penalize that, and it's going to be fine. So and uh, maybe it's going to generate one molecule that is valid. So it's good, and it's going to generate molecules, uh, one molecule that just have a very high score. And your validity here is to do with like valence being present. So uh, why did you just multiply your validity by your units <coughs> to get some composite score and tell you like how many of your samples might actually be feasible and unique? Uh, so so in, in this case, with, um, uh, when a molecule is not valid, 
it doesn't even have a, a, a QEL score. So, the, we, we op so in this case, we are optimizing both. Because, but in, what you have here is you have two numbers which give us competing objectives. Like we want validity to be high and we need this to be low. But if you multiply them, then you have something which. Uh, uh, tr true, true, true. But, uh, but, but there is a problem. There is there is a problem that because um, validity is a score that is given to one molecule. This score is something that you give to a molecule. Uniqueness is something that you give to a set. But validity is also a set, and uniqueness. Is a set. No, validity is not a set. Like a molecule is, 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 is either valid or or not. Like like when you when you optimize the model. But it's the same you, you, you like you. I think the metric you want is. For every thousand samples, how many valid unique molecules am I going to get? Right, that's that's what that's what you want, yeah. right? Both yeah, 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 yeah. So it, that's that would be good. Yeah, you, you can, but we didn't. Yeah. Um, you should wrap up in five minutes. Sure, sure. Um, so one, one of the visualization of that uh, is, is this graph. So you do, as I said, you do pre-training for, for, for a while. And then these are different uh, lambda scores. So for high lambda, the model is going to generate uh, more and more molecules that maximize the score. And for low lambda, uh, way less. Um, we also compare to, uh, to, other, to other works, uh, in particular with character VA, grammar VA, and graph VA and on uh, validity, unique, uh, uniqueness, and uh, novelty. And uh, we, 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 I, I would say that what we, what we can tell is that when you use uh, reinforcement learning, uh, you, you always increase uh, validity compared to, uh, to, to these models, meaning that uh, generating graph uh, seems to be, to be better than generating strings. Uh, and using reinforcement learning seems to to, to play a good like a good role uh, to to generate a novel molecules because uh, with VAEs uh, you 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 always are in a, in a data distribution so it, it's not necessarily true that you are also optimizing novelty but when you when you uh, use reinforcement learning you can also optimize that and, and that's why we we, we can have uh, can have very very high score for that um, we we also compare to in your previous slide, when you so the uniqueness of the VA is much higher than the term, can you come in? Oh, this value? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, it's the same uh, re reason um, <laughs> that I say before. So the. Uh, uh, unique, uniqueness, uniqueness here is very high because uh, this is the data distribution. So when you sample from the data distribution, like all, all of the data points are di uh, very diverse. So the, the model is going to learn to sample from the same distribution. But when you, when you add reinforcement learning, the model. I was asking about comparison with just again. Just like? Just uh, with uh, the W again, without other. Oh, this, this against this one? Yeah. Um, uh, I, so I would say uh, that GANs have mode collapse uh, anyway, even without reinforcement learning. I mean, it's, it's, it's a known fact. And uh, I would say that this is what's happening here. Uh, so it, it's a known uh, behavior of, of GANs. You can also have uh, mode collapse, uh, 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 even with, uh, with GANs. So yeah, I, f I think it's because of that. Um, so we, as I say, we also compare with um, GAN-based models. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a, a work, uh, and also one, one of the authors of that work uh, is, is also here. Uh, and uh, we compare with them, and we, we use the same set, uh, the same, the same, the same uh, split of, of, the, of the data set, but also uh, the f full uh, QM9, because they, they optimize only for, for part of it. And what we ca what we uh, what we discover out of this is that uh, we don't we don't only have a, a better score for some some of the configuration, but it's also very time efficient. So for, uh, for like we have let's say quite good numbers uh, with uh, way way much less uh, training time. And um, these are a bunch of samples. Uh, that uh, the model is uh, the, the model is generating. So this is the 
VAE with RL, and this is the WGAN with RLL, and both of them are trained to optimize the, the Q, Q, QED score. Uh, and as it was also pointed out about Savir yesterday, is that uh, RL can exploit weird, weird, uh, weird patterns that are not in the, the training set. Uh, these, these are things that you find in this in a training set, and these, these are not, for instance. Um, so I want to wrap up and, and, and propose some, some, some future work. Um, so I think that the contribution of what I, I'm doing is to point out that uh, SMICE are way more computationally expensive to, SMICE generation is more uh, computationally expensive to, to, to use, and using likelihood-based models is quite difficult uh, with reinforcement learning. Uh, but I also want to point out that th this works at uh, quite limitations. So we also point out that we don't try trying to uh, optimize any any objective like uniqueness, and it would be nice to explore in the future. And also, we we only play with atoms with up to nine uh, molecules with up to nine atoms, which is also a limitation. Like real drugs are way much way much bigger, and. And we also point out that the model is way is, is maybe too much susceptible uh, to mode columns, and and there, there are some references uh, how to cope with that. So there there is literature on how to address mode collapse, how to use uh, adversarial and variational approaches together. So we might be able to also. Um, to also cope with the fact that you cannot use reinforcement learning with variational encoders, and it w we would also would be nice to to play with the bigger data set and use more realistic functions as like molecules in a 3D space have much more different. Uh, uh, you, you can play also with the 3D coordinates and all this kind of stuff that we didn't. It would be nice to do, that. and that's it. Thank you. Thanks.